Welcome to our new show, 805 Inspires. We look at museums, we look at gardens, and we look at other Santa Barbara treasures that have been closed down during this COVID virus. We're gonna highlight their mission. We're gonna tell fascinating stories and we're gonna provide an activity for everyone at home. So I hope you join us and enjoy this series that we call 805 Inspires. Welcome, Monica. Hi, Eric. It's good to see you. So why don't you go ahead and uh, tell us a little bit about the Mission Archive Library, what it is and its mission, and uh, share a little bit with our, our viewers. The Santa Barbara Mission Archive Library is a cultural, educational, historical nonprofit that was established in 1967. It's located at Old Mission Santa Barbara, but it's a separate nonprofit. It is um, affiliated with the Franciscan Friars of California. And we have a wide uh, collection, a vast collection of historical uh, and cultural resources that help document the work of the friars in Western United States, in colonial New Spain, and in Northern Mexico. Wow, well, you, you know, we, we've been friends a little while and you know I, I, I love the mission. I see some incredible things behind you. Tell us a little bit about what, what Go into a little bit more detail of, of what, what's uh, in the repository. Well, it is a, a really huge collection. And among uh, the treasures here, we have over 4,000 titles in our rare book collection. Uh, many of these were once housed at the California Missions. We also have art and artifacts. We have maps. And we have copies of sacramental registers from the Alta California Missions and some of the Baja. And these are used by people to recreate their family trees and by researchers doing demographic research. So it's a wide, uh, vast collection uh, covering a really wide geographic area. What are some of your favorite pieces? If you had to tell somebody, we have this here, what, what, what jumps out to you? It's really hard to choose, but I think one of uh, our main treasures is a painting. It's the earliest known oil painting of the California mission. It's from about 1832, and it's of Mission San Gabriel. And it's a painting many people recognized. It's used widely to illustrate mission life. And people get very excited when they see it because they never knew it was in our collection that it belongs here. We also have uh, a register uh, of burials that has an entry for the lone woman of San Nicolas Island. And it has um, also there her baptized name that she was given of Juana Maria and that is one of the few pieces of evidence we have that she was actually here. Um, we also have some very old books, the oldest books in our collection. One is from 1487. It's a copy of Imitation of Christ and we have a multi-volume Bible from 1493. They're both printed but they have these beautiful hand illuminations to mark the sections and those are just really special in our collection. Another treasure we have is actually a series of paintings. It's 21 paintings of the Alta California Missions by Edwin Deacon, painted at the end of the 19th century, 50 years or so after the closing of all the missions, except for Old Mission Santa Barbara, which is the only mission that never closed. And it's really a great uh, document. The, they're really great documents of the state of the missions at that point in time and how badly they suffered uh, over the years. Yes, I, I've got to. I've got to come by and, and take a, take a look. We, we're filming this uh, during uh, the COVID nineteen crisis, where a lot of the museums and, and are, are are closed to guests. Um, where can people learn more about and about this this treasure, and how can they support what you guys are doing? People can go to our website, which is sbmal.org, stands for Santa Barbara Mission Archive Library. And they can find on there uh, information about the different parts of our collections, and they can become a member. Uh, actually, membership is key uh, to access the collections. You need to be a member. You also have to make an appointment. Uh, but membership is also a key way that supports the archive library. It's our main source along with donations of, of support, financial support for SBMAL. And uh, like all nonprofits, we rely on the support of our friends here and elsewhere. Great, well, I'm gonna go ahead and become a member. Um, yeah, because I did not know that either. Um, 
As we uh, wrap up the segment, uh, is there anything else you, you'd like to tell uh, your, your audience um, or people listening to us? Well, I hope people do visit us on the website and at the very least sign up to get announcements for our programming when we're back and able to do that. Uh, people don't have to have a PhD to come. They just need to have an interest. Thank you, Monica. It's been a pleasure chatting with you today. Keep up the great work and, and I hope to see you again soon. Thank you, Eric. It's good to see you. Thanks for your support. Hi, I'd like to welcome in Brian Stevenson of the Santa Barbara Mission Archive Library. Brian, you are the um, in charge of programs and collections at the museum? Yes, that's right. Um, so I'm really lucky here because I get to work very closely uh, with the really rich uh, treasure of materials that we have here at the Archive Library, which include um, artworks and documents, diaries, manuscripts. Um, it's a really special collection and I am really privileged to be able to um, work to uh, organize it, uh, protect it, conserve it, and also make the uh, materials in the collection available to researchers who are interested in um, exploring and learning more about uh, the early history of our uh, state. What a fascinating and important job. Wow. Tell me a little bit about what that's like on a day-to-day -day basis. Well, on a day-to-day -day basis, it can really vary. I have, wear a lot of different hats, but um, on any given day, I can uh, you know, sort of work through uh, some of the materials that we have that have not yet been uh, organized and processed, so that includes looking through um, kind of old bankers' boxes of materials, um, rehousing uh, materials into acid-free protective uh, folders and sleeves and housing. Um, I can be doing a little bit of writing, kind of explaining what a particular collection contains within it to facilitate uh, researchers' access. And in addition to that, I get to work really closely with uh, researchers who come in uh, to the Archive Library genealogists who are doing uh, family history research, uh, scholars who are researching a variety of, of uh, projects from the history of wine in California uh, to kind of the relationship between sort of the Franciscan friars and the Chumash. Um, and in addition to that, I get to uh, do a little bit of work uh, with uh, writing curriculum uh, for uh, schools. I do get to do some work with the museum with uh, kind of designing and, and writing some of our interpretive signage. Uh, and I get to plan uh, some programs that we uh, will be offering as well, from sort of lectures to, uh, to concerts of uh, early music. Uh, in addition, uh, twice a week when we are open, uh, I get to uh, lead behind the scenes tours of the Archive Library, which are available uh, for, uh, for the public. You can purchase those tickets through the ticket office. Uh, and they're really uh, special tours. We've had people from all over the world come along on those with us. Um, we set out some of our, you know, sort of most impressive uh, treasures from the collection and uh, guests on those behind the scenes tours get to see, you know, majority areas of the archive library that are off limits to the, to the public at large. And uh, we've had a really positive response. Uh, people really seem to enjoy those tours and we've gotten a lot of really great feedback. Um, and uh, it's a really great opportunity to see some of the, the materials that we have and to learn a little bit more about uh, about an archive and, and about the, the really great work that we're doing here. When do these take place? I'm fascinated, I wanna go. So uh, right now, uh, when the Archive Library is opening, those tours uh, take place Thursdays and Fridays at one o'clock. Well, you've got me excited. Tell me about your website again and then how people can learn more. Um, it's a really great resource, our website. Uh, we have um, links there to finding guides for some of the materials and collections uh, in our website. So if you're interested, or excuse me, in our collection. So if you're interested in learning more, maybe you're wanting to do research into, say, the history of vaqueros in, in California, you can access those finding guides um, and do a search within them to try and find what materials specific, uh, specifically in our collections are going to be relevant to your search. In addition to that, we post information about uh, upcoming events, um, about our tours, as I mentioned. And in addition, we have a really great education uh, page on our website that uh, provides lots of resources to fourth graders who are doing their uh, mission history project, but also to people who are interested in, in kind of Cali California history in general. Uh, we have activity workbooks, we have coloring pages on there. We've also been working in partnership with Old Mission Santa Barbara to put together um, a sort of a series of short videos of uh, California history that uh, kind of go through uh, the mission space um, itself, as well as some of the materials from our collection uh, to kind of highlight some of those treasures and, and share them with people uh, who are not able to make it to the mission 
right now. And then the third part of the segment is an activity. Can you describe what, what you're going to be doing? Yeah, for sure. So um, we are going to be kind of discussing how folks can at home make their own uh, scrapbook or memory book. So it's an opportunity to learn a little bit more about how sort of you and your family can uh, collect and conserve uh, some of your own family history and keep that together in one place in kind of a unique uh, archival quality document that you can then uh, store safely in your home uh, to be able to preserve those memories and kind of some of your own family history uh, for generations to come. We're also going to discuss a little bit about kind of the history of scrapbooking up to now and uh, provide you with some tips for uh, the best practices about how to uh, make those uh, memory books. Well, we're excited to see it and it's great to have you on today. This is our inaugural episode of 805 Inspires. Keep up the great work. Be well and, and thank you for all you do in this community. Thanks very much, Eric. I really appreciate being here with you. So now that you had an opportunity to learn a little more about the Mission Archive Library, I would like to jump into our project together. Uh, we are going to talk about some of the tips and tricks that are useful to make a scrapbook or a family memory book that will allow those, your family memories and your family documents and materials to last for a very long time uh, into the future generations. Uh, but before we get to that, I want to show you some examples from our collection of scrapbooks and memory books from the past so we can look at how that sort of style of collection of materials has changed over time and we can talk a little bit about why we might do things differently now than they did, say, in the 19th century. Mamie Goulet was a young lady who came out to Santa Inez in the late 19th century to help look after her uncle, who was a priest. And she documented her experiences uh, at Santa Inez. And you can, so when people think of a scrapbook, this is often what they think about. You've got sort of pictures pasted in, you've got little blurbs written here, and this is a very conventional scrapbook, and people have scrapbooked this, this way for ages. Um, this is not the best way to keep these kinds of materials going forward, um, because it does not preserve the photos the best way that we can, and then any other, what we call in the archives world, ephemera, which is brochures, uh, little flyers, just kind of little odds and ends that don't really fit into another category. So what we are going to do is sort of look, trace through how these change over the years. One of the things that people often put in their scrapbooks is newspaper clippings, uh, which is great, but newspaper is one of the most unstable kinds of paper that exists. It's made from really cheap, uh, really acidic paper. So if you've ever seen an old newspaper, you might see the outsides of the edges of the paper start to turn brown and brittle. That's because it's very unstable and it'll deteriorate very quickly. Um, one of the things about very acidic paper is it can rub onto other materials and transfer the acids onto uh, non-acidic materials and damage them as well. Uh, so we want to be sure that when we're working with newspaper that we want to uh, sort of separate it out and preserve it uh, in a way that is going to make the other materials in the scrapbook or the memory book safe. For example, this is um, a collection of newspaper clippings related to um, St. Junipero Serra from the 1950s and 1960s. And you can see, again, traditional scrapbooking pasting these things in, you can see how the glue is popping through and has kind of ruined um, the image, has ruined the uh, pages from that were being pasted in here. Um, so when we get a piece like this where we have two kinds of uh, newsprint facing each other, or even one piece of newspaper facing, say, a photograph, what we're going to want to do is we're going to take special alkaline paper. This is a non-acid paper that actually acts as a buffer and sits in the middle there to preserve and protect the materials on both sides so that they don't damage each other. Even when we're preserving newspapers here at the Archive Library, we usually pull the newspapers out and separate them and protect them from each other so the different kinds of paper don't react with each other. So here we have a page from the Los Angeles Sunday Ma Los Angeles Times Sunday Magazine from 1930, and you can see we have it kind of folded up in this nice special buffer paper to protect it. Uh, and then that's even encased in another enclosure that we're gonna put inside this acid-free box where we keep some of our other newspaper uh, clippings. So this is an example of how we have here at the Archive Library kind of taken some old scrapbooks and kind of played with them a little bit to put them in a more safe, secure, stable environment uh, to get them kind of out of that traditional format and into one that's going to be more secure so that these materials can last for generations to come. So this is coming from the Edith Webb collection. 
and you can see that what we've done is we've actually taken the materials out of the scrapbook entirely and put them into this nice acid-free three-ring binder. And then we've also put the materials from the scrapbook into these special um, acid-free uh, polyethylene uh, sleeves so that you can get lots of different materials in here. They're not reacting with each other. And it's also nice too because as you're turning the pages, you're not worried about, say, tearing a page or anything like that. So it keeps things nice and secure. And you can also, with the nice thing about the sleeves is you can do back to back like that. So you can sort of see the materials as they were meant to be seen in a scrapbook, but they're sort of in the best archival condition that they can be. So as you're thinking about how you're gonna make your own memory book or your album, or maybe even a time capsule, uh, one of the ways that I wanna show you how to do this is kind of in a very traditional sort of archives kind of a way. Uh, oftentimes, the most often way that we preserve things here in the archives is we put individual sheets of paper into acid-free folders. Those acid-free folders go into boxes, and then boxes go into storage. So if you wanna make kind of a more traditional uh, archival approach to your family album, it's very easily done. Uh, we've been talking a lot about newspaper and how newspaper is very acidic and can damage other materials. Um, these days, most of the newspapers that we're reading are probably online, but if there's a particular article that you're interested in, you can print that off just at your home computer with your home printer, just as I've done here with this article from today's uh, news. And as I said, you can get acid-free folders at most sort of office supply stores. So you would just go ahead and put the article inside the folder thusly. Maybe make a little note to yourself, the date of the article, what it's called, maybe why it was that you thought it was special. And then you can just get any old banker's box and then tuck that right in there. Uh, you can put uh, letters, you can put artworks, you can put um, photographs if you want to in here, and then you can put this box someplace safe. Remember that materials like things to be cool and dry and dark. So if you can put it someplace where the temperature is gonna be below 70 degrees, if it's gonna be kind of low humid and that temp temperature and humidity is not gonna fluctuate a lot, that's gonna be the best for it. If you're more interested in making a scrapbook similar to like what we saw with the Mammy Goulet collection, um, I would encourage you to not do the old school way of pasting things in with glue, but instead getting yourself, say, a three ring binder. You can just get one of these at any office supply store. Um, and I would fill it with these protective sleeves. They're, they're, you can find these also at most office supply stores. Uh, make sure that it's indicated that it's archival safe on there. And as you can see, they come in different forms. This is a four pocket version. They come in two pockets or just single sleeve. I've tucked a couple of old photographs from the 1920s in here. Um, if, you have, if your family has drawings that they want to save or maybe a family recipe that you want to hang on to, you can tuck those into the single sheets here. That protects the different kinds of media from each other and it also preserves it so as you're turning the pages you don't have to worry about ripping or anything like that. So hopefully that gives you a couple ideas of how to go about saving some of your family history so that you can put that aside and have those memories for decades to come. So that wraps up our fascinating look at the Santa Barbara Mission Archive Library. Thank you to Dr. Monica Rosco, Executive Director, and Brian Stevens, Collections and Program Manager. And I hope you enjoyed the activity. Thanks again for tuning in to 805 Inspires.